have uh, we've got the we've got the quality here, but some of the quantity is missing. Uh, we've had about uh, twice as many registers, or, and, and, and we've got a lot of people who are registered that are not here. I think that's probably the judge security system, and they're taking the them back to impound instead of letting them in. But uh, we're excited about being here. We're excited about you guys being here. Uh, the Tennessee Safer Grant, the statewide Safer Grant is just going great, and that's because of the hard work of a lot of people in this room, and uh, we appreciate you a lot. We really do. On behalf of the Tennessee Fire Chiefs Association and the International Association of Fire Chiefs and Williamson County Fire and EMA, I just want to welcome you guys. This is the first of three leadership training workshops that we're going to be doing, specifically on retention of firefighters. You know, the grant's going great. We have, statewide, we've brought in hundreds of new volunteer firefighters, and we know there's more coming. There's a lot of people still in the pipeline from applying to be actually trained and on the trucks, but uh, that part's going great. You know, we have uh, done the PSAs, it's 30, 60, and 90 second PSAs using real Tennessee firefighters, and we're getting a lot of positive feedback from that. Uh, and we do have, we have produced a new USB, I call it a thumb drive, a pinky stick, something like that, but uh, <laughs> Jenny was giving those out to you, and there's just a wealth of information on there. You can share that, and we've got plenty. If you've got fire departments that are not in the program that you know need one, because they can literally take that USB and build their own recruit, recruitment and retention program, and they can, all the stuff's in there, the, the uh, marketing materials, uh, how to do an open house, how to do this, how to do that. It's, all that material's in there if they'll take the time to do it and, and find out what you guys are doing and how successful it is. So we really need to get that information out. There's a lot of national level information in there from BCOS and uh, from the International Fire Chiefs, things that are working nationwide. And so, we, you know, what works well, what doesn't work well. So. We want you to do that, but we're specifically now talking about retention of those volunteers we bring in and also the ones you already have. And these presentations are gonna to apply to your, there's, there's combination departments in here that have some career and some volunteer, and this is gonna to apply to your career guys too. Uh, how, to, how to retain them, how to get them on the team, how to motivate them, and so it, it applies to all firefighters, uh, even though we're specifically looking at volunteers. We're going to be giving you a certificate at the end that will uh, that you can use for officer training hours if you want to with ISO. I mean, it'll qualify for that. But it's specifically officer training. Um, Vicki Pritchett, as you know, is is on the program to be speaking later today, but she's not going to be here. She they've had a death at Pleasant View, and both she and Shane Ray are. Uh, or the speakers at the funeral, so she kind of needs to be there, you know? And so, so she's having to fly in for that, so her plane was delayed, she couldn't get here because of the flight, and now this funeral's come up, so she uh, she won't be with us, so I hate to tell you we're gonna probably leave early, you know? I know some of you guys wanna make that long drive all the way back to Atoka, or all the way back to West Carter. And that's what I'm exciting about this, we do have guys here from, even though this is the Middle Tennessee, you know, meeting, we're going to do one East, Middle, West. This is the East, this is the Middle Tennessee, but we've got guys here from Far East Tennessee and Far West Tennessee, too. So that's what we wanted. We, we, you know, we want you to come to all three of them. They're going to really be good. Uh, in hindsight, we probably shouldn't have planned uh, today because it's tomorrow's Mother's Day. I appreciate you guys' the loyalty and discipline being here, and that's probably what's Kept some of the attendance down as Mother's Day. I told Shakir we don't need to do it as Mother's Day, and he said, it's not my mother, let's go, let's do it anyway. <laughs> so, anyway, we, uh, we're excited you're here. Like the one on for <laughs> the planning, the one in, Middle, in, in West Tennessee is gonna be September 15th in Jackson. And we'll be sending you more stuff on that later. But uh, we're looking forward to it. But again, Vicky's not gonna be here, so we probably are gonna, be out of here by three so you guys can get back. Um, let me see, we're gonna have lunch, you know, in there there's breakfast stuff still, and you know, feel free to go get something if you want to. Uh, and then later on there will be lunch there at 12. 
But I want to uh, turn it over to Chief Love now. We're going to, well, no, I don't. I want to turn it over to Jay Monson. First of all, what I want to do is say thank you to Williamson County for letting us use this state-of-the-art facility. And a lot of this stuff is, actually is state-of-the-art, a lot of it's high dollar. So don't be, don't be pushing these buttons. You know, you may launch missiles, you never know. So don't push nothing and try not to pour your coffee down in there to see what happens. But uh, we appreciate Williamson County, they, they have been a hard participator in this program, and they're always opening up their facilities to us when we need it. So uh, let's give them a hand, and Jay needs to talk to you a little bit. I'd like to echo uh, Chief Phillips here, welcoming you guys Thank you very much, and I'd like to echo uh, Chief Phillips here, in welcoming you guys to uh, to this facility and to the uh, to, to the program here today. On behalf of Mayor Anderson, the Mayor of Williamson County, and Bill Jorgensen, our Office of Public Safety Director, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Williamson County Office of Public Safety, our public safety complex. Uh, in this particular facility, this is the uh, emergency operations center for activations of disasters or whatever, tornadoes and anything else that might come up. Uh, just last week, Wednesday, we had a, a huge floor exercise in here where every station was filled and we were uh, playing like we got hit with a tornado and things like that. So we exercise that once a quarter in here. Just to kind of give you some familiarize yourself with your surroundings, you're in the EOC, so if you're looking at the map up here, that kind of center open space is where you're sitting here now. If you go out this, these doors and bear around to the left or where the main public restrooms are, if uh, those are kind of filled up, there's a single seaters. If you go out that door to the right, and around the corner that you can also go to. So uh, to get out of the building in an emergency, you want to go out the front doors or you can go out a side door over here to get out outside the building. Uh, the building was built about uh, two years ago. Uh, cost us around $28, $29 million, somewhere around in there uh, to build. It's a completely hardened facility. Uh, if you noticed as you walked in the doors, the doors are real heavy. Those, all of our outside doors and windows are rated to uh, about 300 miles an hour wind, winds. <clears throat> so an F5 tornado up, up to and including an F5 tornado uh, not able to penetrate the building. Uh, the building infrastructure itself is built to a certain seismic activity. We're supposed to be able to withstand pretty well anything that they expected for us here. The only thing we have problems with is our antennas on the roof are just sort of super glued on so they get ripped off. We've got some extra tools. So, uh, uh, everything is back powered. We have uh, generators and we also have natural gas back power. It, it can completely uh, sustain itself and run itself the entire time. So uh, if you have any questions about the facility or anything like that, just let me know. As Eddie alluded to you, please don't touch any buttons. Uh, there's a center button at your particular position right there. If any of you remember back not too long ago in Hawaii, the guy that pushed the button to warn them about the, the missiles, that's the button. Don't, don't push that button. You don't want to be the guy I'm seeing <laughs> Have your picture, you know. Missile warning. I'm just joking with you. That, that'll actually raise a computer out of the desk, out of the table there. So if you hit it, don't hit it. It's not a big deal. But again, I'd just like to welcome all of you here. If you have any questions, uh, pretty much there are Williamson County people who are kind of mostly congregated here in the center of the back. Somebody there can ask, answer a question, get you directed to where you need to go. Um, we have been very uh, pleased with the recruitment retention grant. So far, the recruitment portion of it has done very well with us. Uh, we've seen an increase of some hundreds of 105 or so uh, firefighters over the last year that we've uh, been working with this grant and keeping going. We're very excited to get into the retention portion now because we really want to see a, that retention uh, part of the goal. Everybody laughed at when they asked about the our goal. We really we really do want a thousand volunteers in five years. And we're pushing forward with that, that goal. Uh, if there's anything we can do to help you, then thank you. We appreciate you coming. Thank you, sir. Well, we want to get into this now because we want to talk about leadership and, and team building and motivation of your firefighters because we all know that's how you retain them. Like many studies have shown that, that leadership is what retains people. They want to be part of an organization they can be proud of and they want to achieve they can be proud of and officers they can be proud of. 
and they we want and we want them to become part of the family. And you guys all know this. We're kind of speaking to the choir, but we're going to get some good information that we want to learn and and also to take back and not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer. Go back and apply this stuff. So anyway, we're excited to have Chief Matt Love with us. Matthew Love. He is out of Colorado Springs, uh, Pasco County fire out there. Uh, big combination fire department. He's used to working with volunteers and recruiting and retaining them, but he's two years ago, uh, Chief Love realized that he doesn't smoke marijuana, so he, he would go ahead and he got this call to leave Colorado and go to Florida. For some reason, he felt like the people on the beach needed fire protection too, so he answered the call at the Fort Myers Beach, and he's been suffering down there ever since, you know, and Fort Myers is rough. It's rough. I know that. Uh, Kingman Schultz, who's a chief down there with him in Naples, he sent me a picture of a big boa constrictor. It looked like about as long as their fire engine. It had come out of the Everglades because of the brush fire. And he said, see, y'all think it's all funny games down here in Florida fighting fire. And I said, yeah, well, you know, I think it was already dead. I know in Tennessee what we would have done with it, but uh, anyway. But Chief, we're glad to have you here. He, he'll tell you more about himself. Call this on the fire department. Please respond to a fire alarm. And that's what you're asking. Call this on the fire department. Please respond to a fire alarm. And twin crowd at Highway 3, number 1, on the toll station.
Can you hear me okay? Good morning. I had the louder microphone than everybody else. Good morning. Welcome. How is everybody doing? Fantastic. Well, thank you for being here on your Saturday morning, the day before Mother's Day. As they mentioned, you are all dedicated and committed to the, the subject today. As said, my name is Matt Love, and I come from Florida by way of Colorado. I went from the, the cool Colorado mountains to the tropical beach, and I still have not quite acclimated yet, but I uh, don't know where I'm going to end up. I appreciate you bringing me out here today, and again, I appreciate all of you being here. It's uh, very important what we're going to talk about today, but at the same time, it's, it's a pretty fun topic. We've talked um, introductory about recruitment, retention, what it means to keep people and why people stay. And as the chief said when we started, a lot of it comes back to these key fundamental components of leadership. Do people leave departments or do people leave leaders? We've, we've talked about that. So today, my goal is to give you some of that stuff. I want to give you some tools that you can walk away with today and you can use right away to start creating this environment within your organization. This always happens. Everybody sits a little further, so I got my card on wheels so I could just move a little bit closer to you as you, you sift a little further away from me. Um, I'm here for you today because I'm not about ready to retire. As you can tell, I'm, I'm still a pretty young dude. I'm a little over 20 years into my career and I probably have that much left. And so I am committed to making sure I get out here and share some things with you well before I retire because I've been blessed to been taught a lot of lessons. I have had a lot of failures and I've had a few successes and I want to get out there and share with you what did work and what didn't work so you can bypass some of that sort of stuff and you can get rocking and rolling with your people. The two subjects, or the two areas we're talking about today is you and them. You the leader, and them the people you lead. You the leader, the one that creates this environment within your organization, and those you're trying to recruit, retain, you're trying to lead every day. The folks you take care of, the folks you work for in the organization. And so we watched that opening video, and we do that for a reason. If you could see something in that video, something gave you a glimpse and got you just the littlest bit excited, then it can work for you. We see a lot of things in a, in a promotional video like that are the reason we started, the reason we got in the business, the stuff we don't get to do every day, but when we do get to do it, wow, that gets me going, that motivates me. So if you could pull any little thing from that video, you'll be able to grab onto this today. And if it works for you, it can work for them. It can work for your team and the folks that you're trying to invigorate, the folks you're trying to create this motivational environment. Those little glimpses of those exciting moments and why we got into this business are the, the things that keep us going. I've had a blessed career so far and I've been able to see a lot of volunteer and career recruitment, recruitment tactics work and some that just heavily failed. So I'm going to try and give you as many pitfalls today as possible so you can understand how to overcome them right away. The first thing though I want to do before we even get, ex, uh, get started and because I realize I'm the I'm the morning guy on Saturday morning. I'm going to have to move you around a little bit. Some of you got looked for the exit as soon as I said that. I'm going to move you around a little bit, but it's only to get you ready to learn. It's only to get you ready for this feeling. So I tell you what I'm going to do first. I'm going to ask my friends to drop the lights down for just a second. I, I'm going to give you a little, little mood music here. And I want, you to, I want you to try and get into the mode with me for a little bit. I want to introduce a few people to you this morning. Is that helping? Tell, tell me when you're feeling it. Now. Does that do it for you? Not, not quite yet? Move around. You feeling a little bit? What is your name, sir? Jonathan. Folks, I'm going to introduce a couple stars of the show to you this morning. So without further ado, watch, if you knew he was here, Jonathan, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear for Jonathan. Give it to me as loud as you can for Jonathan. Folks, if you knew she was here, this table would be full. Did you know? Give it your best for Jessica right here. Woo! Yes, Jessica, your best. Okay, we can bring the lights back up for the moment. The first thing I get when I do things like that are people say, really, the dude travels with a disco ball. He brings his own disco ball flashlight. Why does he do things like that? And it's not the last time. But the why behind that is because I want you to understand right before we get started, the star of today's show is not up front, and the star of today's show is not the folks that have been introducing it to you. It is the people in these seats. You are absolutely the star of this show. You are the ones that are going to make this difference happen. You're the ones that are going to change a fire service culture for the positive and invigorate these new volunteers coming in, these new career folks coming in. You're going to cater an environment to changing generations. The star is you. 
And as soon as we start to realize that, you can get ready to learn. Because you can realize you're it. You're the ones we're talking about here today. So there may be a few more moments where I put you out of your comfort zone. I'll try not to pick on the same people too often. You, sit, you sat so close to me. But I'll wheel it around somewhere else. But I'll keep you moving around a little bit. I'm going to start with this. In the fire service, we do a lot. We, we equate a lot to experience. We have a lot of folks that have a good, solid 10 years of experience, say, in the fire service. But we also have a lot of people that are packing 15 into the 10. You know what I'm talking about? Those people that are, man, they're working their rear end off every day. They're trying to get the most out of it. They're going to classes. They're, they're driving. They're packing 15 into 10. Raise your hand if you also have people in your fire service that repeat year one over again 10 times. Is there a difference between 10 years of experience and repeating year one over again 10 times? Well, we've seen that, and part of that is what we're coming back to today. We want to create an environment where we're motivating people to pack 15 into 10 rather than repeating year one over again 10 times. And we talk about experience and time quite a bit in the fire service, but I will argue that your 10 years of experience is probably very much different than her 10 years of experience. You've trained differently, you've had more fires, you've gone to more calls. 10 years of experience is kind of an odd quantity. So with that, we can't just focus on time, we gotta focus on what we are doing with that time. Are we packing 15 into 10, if you will? And the goal is for us as leaders to create an environment where folks are motivated to pack 15 into 10. And I believe that motivation is accomplished through training from great leadership. Through training from great leadership. And motivation equals happiness in the job, and motivation equals job satisfaction. And what does job satisfaction equal? It means people stick around. It means retention. So with that said, I, I mentioned training, a key, key word in the fire service, one of the best things of the fire service. If I said, let's go train, what would your team's response be? What would your response be? Would it be positive? Would it be negative? Would it be, eh, I don't know. One of the toughest things for us to come back from as leaders is ever allowing training to become a dirty word. Once training becomes a negative aspect of our business, it is so tough to get back from that. And granted, training is one of the greatest things we can do. When you accomplish things and you feel like, I got this down, you're happy in your job. You enjoy what you're doing. But when training becomes a dirty word, when training goes negatively and we end on a bad note and we, don't be, we, we can't do it and do it new until we get it right, training becomes a dirty word. And it's tough for us to overcome in the fire service. My freshman year of EFO, I wrote a paper called Company Officers Training Beyond the Status Quo, Beyond the Bare Minimum, Training to a Higher Level. And there's a few things that came out of that paper. I'm hoping some of them are real duh things for you. The first one is, as leaders in the fire service, we must be competent. Hopefully that's a duh. But the second part of that is we must remain competent. It's not enough to achieve the rank, achieve the position, put the badge and the bugles on, and be done. We live in an incredibly fast-changing environment. As leaders, we must be competent and stay competent to lead this crew. In fact, fire service leaders, one of the most pivotal positions is our company officers, those folks on the truck every day with our folks. They have one of the most unique jobs in the fire service. They have to do the same job of those that they supervise. And a lot of businesses aren't that way. It's not just lieutenant, it's lieutenant and firefighter. It's not just firefighter, it's firefighter and captain one of the only ranks in the fire service that has to do the same job of the people they supervise. All the more reason they need to be competent and stay competent. And I'll talk quite a bit about credibility and what goes into that. Second thing from this, this research came, we must create an atmosphere as leaders where our folks can screw it all up and then fix it without training becoming a dirty word. We have to create an atmosphere where our folks can fail and they can figure out how to fix it, and then we can end on a good note, and they feel confident in their capability, and we can move on down the road and serve our communities. Three, I hope three is a duh, we must lead by example. Hopefully some of you are shaking your head, well, yeah, I, mean, I didn't need you to come here to tell me I gotta lead by example. But I would submit to you there is no such thing as leadership without some components of example. It just can't be done. And finally, the fourth thing, we need a culture change, if you will, in fire service leadership. And that's really the premise of my presentation today. We need a culture change that identifies our responsibility as leaders to know our team so well 
that we can create this environment that motivates them, that makes them want to pack 15 into 10. And not because some general leadership blank technique we read in a book, not something of me saying this is my leadership style and I'm good. No, no, no. Something specific to knowing our people so well that we create this catered environment to our team. As we know, we have younger generations or new folks coming into the fire service and we have to attack that differently. They all look at things a little differently and later today we're gonna to talk about who, what makes up these people and why and how we attain it. But we've got to be focused on knowing our folks so well that we could create an environment that makes them wanna pack 15 into 10, where training is a positive and productive word. So I talked about kind of getting pumped up and feeling it and you know, the idea with the disco ball, I'll give you an example. Years back, I was a driver engineer of a ladder truck. I was always looking for ways to get my crew all excited and I'd stand on a table in the bay with my flashlight off my bunker coat and when, when they'd walk in and I'd announce them. So I'd be like, driving truck 19, driver engineer Williamson. It lasted a couple of days. <laughs> it didn't last too long, but it got them excited. It got them out of their comfort zone, right? They just, they, they realized this is the best job in the world. This is awesome. We're playing around. We're having a good time. And so I do things like that to get you pumped up because I want you to recognize you cannot give what you do not have. My friend Stephen Gower, who wrote the book, What Do They See When They See You Coming, says you cannot give what you do not have. And so if we're expecting to motivate our team, we're expecting to create an environment that equals satisfaction, retention, we got to have it first. We have to make sure we're there to be able to give something. So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about bringing back the feeling, bringing back the feeling of conferences like this. But once again, once again, I'm going to ask everybody, stand up for just a moment with me, please. I need you to, with the help of James Brown, just move it around a little bit. Just, just move it around just a little bit. Shakir will set the standard, I'm sure. But move it around just a little bit. Ease yourself up. There might be prizes for some of the best moves over here. I mean, it's more than a stretch. It's more than a stretch. It's, you got hips a little bit. Just, you're feeling it. As soon as I think you're feeling it, we'll move on. Okay, okay, I see, I see it. All right. There, there's just no telling how many times I'm going to do that. But uh, when I'm the first guy of the day on a Saturday, you know. So I said, bring back the feeling. Why do we do things like that? Why does, why does Matt put on James Brown and why do you do things like that? It's to get you out of your comfort zone a little bit. It's to loosen up a little bit. It's to get you ready to learn and it's to protect from training becoming a dirty word. Training doesn't have to be a rough thing. It doesn't have to be a nasty thing. It can involve James Brown and Matt with a disco ball. Whatever kind of gets us going and ready to learn without training becoming a dirty word. So one of the tools I want to give you today is bringing back the feeling. So I would go to conferences all around, just like you. Go into conferences and you get jazzed up at this conference, maybe because some goofball in a disco ball is getting you going, but whatever it was, it gets you jazzed up. And you go back to your organization, but they weren't there. They don't feel what you felt. How do you bring back that feeling to your team? And I have tried a variety of things to bring back the feeling, like I talked about my flashlight standing on the table. I've all done all these crazy things, tried to recreate the presentation, but sometimes it's very difficult to bring back that feeling to our team. And so that's one of the things I'm going to focus on today with you is ways for you to bring back the feeling, ways you can take what we're going to talk about today and do something with it, you know, help your team feel the excitement. I'll even give you the link on where to buy a flashlight disco ball, if that's what it takes for you to be excited. I'm going to talk to you a few things about ways to feel it, but also ways to take care of yourself. Again, coming back to you cannot give what you do not have. It's one thing to get your people all excited, but you have to keep pumped up. I call it your tank has to be fueled up. How do you fuel your leadership tank? We'll talk about that a little bit. And then finally, I'm going to cover what we genuinely and sometimes generically refer to as the fundamentals of leadership. And I say it like that because our U.S. Fire Administration doesn't even like us calling it leadership anymore. They want us to call it exercising leadership. It's an action. It takes work. It doesn't just happen, right? And so I'm going to give you some examples of how we can actually use that to make a difference. Our attitude in this leadership component is very contagious. You know, what you bring to the table for your folks and this concept of retention is very contagious. And so again, if we have it, then we can do it for them. And so I'm going I'm to give you an example. 
I have some toys in the corner of my office. Most people, they think they're for when kids come around, right? And they're, they're not. They're, they're for me. So when the day's going kind of rough, we make some tough decisions at headquarters, maybe some tough politics are taking place, I get on the intercom throughout the entire headquarters building and I declare a rock out session. And everybody comes into my office, everything from the receptionist to the fire marshal to the ops chief, they come into my office, they grab a toy instrument, we pump up a song, and we rock out. For three minutes, it keeps us going for three weeks, for three months. Sometimes we even have to dim the lights so we don't judge each other's level of rock out, because some people get so into it. And what does it do to rock out in the fire chief's office? Well, it chills everybody out a little bit. It reminds us we are here to still have fun. Everybody's just a kid inside, even the fire chief, and it's okay. It's okay to just loosen up a little bit and get back to work. And as I said, what lasts three minutes can keep us going for three weeks, three months, just getting out of our comfort zone and loosening up a little bit. It reminds us so much that this is a phenomenal profession to be in. Whether we are career, volunteer, doing it part-time, what a phenomenal profession we work in. And actually, as leaders, as trainers, that's one of the best cards we can have in our deck is we have an industry that it's pretty tough to compete with. I'm going to give you some examples today because I certainly don't want this to be all the sugar-coated stuff. Best of luck. I'm going to try and give you some examples of how we've used this in some different situations. And I say that because if we're only trying to appeal to the people that ride the fire truck, we can, we can appeal to them with big red truck and, and saving lives, but there's other people in your organization too. There's other levels of volunteers or other levels of career folks that have different say attributes. So I'm going to start with Lupita. Lupita was an um, administrative assistant in my last organization. Now Lupita does not ride the BRT, the big red truck. She doesn't get to do what our folks get to do in the street. So how do we create this motivational environment for Lupita? Well, Lupita as an office assistant, she found reward in knowing what she did helped us do our job better. And as soon as I figured that out, I could find ways to put her out front so she could see the benefits of her work. So she's writing checks or approving purchase orders or doing administrative work and she doesn't get to see the end of it. But if I put her on a truck once a month for a few hours to run some calls, she saw the benefit of what she did and she was just fired up. She felt valued and she knew even though she didn't ride a fire truck, she was an equal. She was just as important in that organization. As soon as we figured that out, we could create this motivational environment for Lupita, even though she doesn't ride a fire truck. Now, a few years back, Lupita had a terrible and tragic event. She lost her daughter in a traffic accident. One of the worst things a mother or father could go through in our organization. It, it was tough for us to go through that time with her. But when she came back to work after losing that daughter, she is still the smiling face you see when you walk through that door. She is still one of the happiest people in the organization, just happy to be there, even the tragedy she's been through, because that's her home. She feels valued, that's her place. Because the environment around her was the one she wanted to keep coming back to. And it was because people went out of their way to create an environment catered for her, not just a blanket technique. So that's the power of this concept of knowing our people well enough to create an environment. A few years back, my wife said, Matt, I think you need to get a degree in me. If you're married, this is a bit of a red flag. If your spouse says you need to get a degree, it means you don't have a degree, apparently. She said, you know, when we're dating, it's like we're in high school, and when we've been engaged, maybe I'm working on your associate's degree, but now that we've been married for a while, you should, you should have a bachelor's degree or higher in me. And, uh, you know, I always joke with her and say, oh, you're, you're in fifth grade, and I'm working on my doctorate, when we all know the absolute truth is I am in elementary school, and she probably has her doctoral degree in me. But this is not a marriage class by any means, but it's a concept of getting a degree in someone, knowing our team that well, knowing our team well enough that we really have a degree in them. We know our people, and we can actually create this environment based on who they are. Because as fire officers, we know when it's life and death and when it's not, but when it is, it is. And the better we know our team, the better we can respond to that, the better we can put them in situations to be successful. In a little bit, or later on, we're going to talk about islands of personality, and that may sound familiar to some of you that's seen a movie. And I'm going to talk more about this concept of getting a degree in our team. But I want you to dwell on that for a moment, is think about who could you do a better job as a leader in getting a degree in? Who in your team can you focus on in the next week to get a degree in them? 
And what does that mean? It just means a little bit of time, listening a little bit, and trying to understand who they are. Because I guarantee if you have those components, you're going to create an environment that makes them want to stick around just by listening in general. Our people are, are very manipulable. They're kind of like this Play-Doh. Our team can be molded like this Play-Doh, right? They're looking to be molded. They're not, they're not firmed up yet, especially these new folks we're bringing in that we now want to retain. And we can mold them, and we can teach them our techniques. They will be a mirror of our attitude, our techniques, our ethic. And just as much as we can mold these people, we can crush them just the same. And it's easy in their first year in the fire department to, to crush them and say, well, they just couldn't cut it, or they just weren't the right person. It's a lot harder for us as leaders to almost protect them during that first period of time because they're Play-Doh. They're not solid yet. They need time to gain stability. So as leaders, we have this responsibility to almost protect our folks till they grow that, grow that strength. Because they will model you. They will mold into whatever you create for them. And again, back to you being the star of the show, you're in the driver's seat of what our folks become. They're going to look like you. They're going to talk like you. Your attitude is exactly what our new folks are going to emit. And so if they're that moldable and that fragile at first, protect them, know them well enough to create this environment so that we can continue to model them on in the future. That concept of keeping training a dirty word, I'm going to give an example. I worked with a firefighter, and I noticed he was excited to come to work, and he got assigned to my ladder company, and as time went on, you could tell he just wasn't enjoying it. He started calling in sick a lot. He started to not be around in the station. And when that little red light turned on, we had an incident. You could tell his face was not smiling. It went the other way. And a lot of us can say, what a tragedy. As much as we don't want to admit it, when that little red light goes on, we get to go do what we've trained to do. I always say, I don't want emergencies to happen, but if they got to happen, they need to happen in my district on my shift when I'm working, right? We train and train and train. We want to go out there and do it. So this dude, that red light would come on, and his face would just drain. And so it got so bad that he was on a performance improvement plan. He was, he was ready to be terminated from the organization because of his lack of ability to perform his, his duty. And spending a little time with him, we chiseled it all the way down to the fact that he'd been assigned to ride a ladder truck and he was not confident in throwing ground ladders. That was it. He let his inability to throw ground ladders well ruin his career. And so obviously we focus, we focus, we focus on throwing ground ladders and get him confident at throwing ground ladders. And we model this behavior. But it's an example of how he allowed training to become a dirty word. He failed at throwing ground ladders. And as officers, we didn't respond to it with, let's practice again, let's do it till you get it right. You end on a bad note, training becomes a dirty word, and it almost ruined his career. So that example I give you is just how powerful training becoming a dirty word can be and how powerful it is to get down to the root cause, know our folks that well, so we can know what that one little thing is, so they don't ruin a beautiful profession like this. I speak a lot about modeling, because I believe our responsibility as leaders is to do that. But I also will never not talk about our United States Fire Administration's National Professional Development Model. I'm sure you have seen this. This is the, the pyramid of what we're supposed to be doing, right? And in the middle, you got all those certifications we're supposed to get, all the certs in the Firefighter 1 and the Fire 2. And in the blue area, you got the education, the higher education, the college level, stuff like that. Over on this side, we have training. You get to the line of purple. Who's in the line of purple? Those guys wearing the white shirts, you know, you go from operations to risk management, and then the whole world changes. <laughs> and you, you'd just rather us not go to fires because somebody could get hurt and it'd be a workers' comp claim. This development model is what we use as a fire service to see where we need to go see what we're working on. But there's a couple of things they forgot. There's a couple of things that are not that human resource stuff and they're not that NFPA 1021 stuff. It is the people. And if you haven't guessed it already, this presentation is all about our team. None of this stuff matters if we don't sprinkle on top of it our team. None of this cool certs and the stuff we have on the wall of me matters unless we are using it to benefit these people. This one, one concept will help you through this process. If you start to view it instead of they work for you and you view it as you work for them, you the leader work for them, all of this stuff is gonna click differently. All this cool stuff you have, and these professional designations and this education you have, as long as you're using it every day to better them, that's when you're gonna see the reward. 
And that's when the stuff really matters, to have those credentials, that education, that ability. I'm going to give you another example. This is Matt. He's a fire captain. His, his title is the coolest. He's the captain of training, leadership, and development. Coolest title in the fire service. He rides the big red truck here and there. He saves lives. He makes a difference. But when asked what motivates him, it wasn't the saving lives. It was the fact that he's a training captain, and when he saw those troops or those officers actually do what he had trained them to do, he felt the reward. As soon as we found that out about Matt, what do we do? We create an environment where he gets to see it. We made him an acting battalion chief, and so he covered the battalion chief shift every once in a while. What does he do? He goes to fires. He sees those guys do what he trained them to do. That was the most satisfying thing for Matt, to watch new recruits do it on the fire ground or watch officers perform well because of what he had trained them to do. And again, this is another example of how this technique of knowing your people really well can make a difference when everybody's not the same. They're not all just motivated because they get to ride the truck. There's those other components of it. And for Matt, it was just simply knowing that he had passed on the ability to train others. So a lot of this sort of stuff doesn't sound too complex. I can tell you that really one of the secrets to knowing our people this well and actually doing something with that is one word. Listen. As simple as that word sounds, listen. Who on your team doesn't want to be heard? Who on your team doesn't feel valued when you, the leader, listen to them? Just listen to learn some of these things. But how you listen is important. There's two ways you can listen. You can listen for affirmation. Let me clarify. The glorification of yourself because you wear the bugles, because you're the leader. You, you listen to a, a sports radio talk show and people call in and they, they like to have their own beliefs affirmed. Or you watch a news channel that affirms your own views. Affirmation feels good, especially as a leader when you've achieved a rank and so forth. It feels good to know you're there. But when we're listening for affirmation, we're not getting many tools for motivation. The second way we can listen instead of affirmation is for information. So when you are spending time with your folks and you're listening to them, listening for information about who they are, what motivates them, what makes them tick, what makes them want to rock and roll, that's the information that leads to motivation. Affirmation or information. Information is the key to creating a motivational environment for our folks, knowing them that well. When I promoted out of the fire station and into an office, I call it the D-shift because I ride the desk, <laughs> the D-shift, and uh, one of my mentors said, Matt, you don't have to move so quick now. You don't have to make 14-second decisions anymore. You can slow down, and you can phone a friend. Just like on the t TV game show, you can phone a friend. And phoning a friend was one of the best ways I learned how to use my mentors to their fullest. I would make a phone call. I would ask somebody that had already been there and done that, what the heck I was doing, and they would coach me. Phoning a friend made a big difference. Here's another example. 360. We ask our officers, when you guys arrive to a fire scene, to get a 360, right? And as you get a 360 of that structure fire, you're looking for things. You're gathering intel. You're reading fire. You're reading smoke patterns. You're looking for bars on the window, Cujo in the backyard, whatever it may be. You're getting all this intel before you commit your troops to the hazard zone. So if we grab a 360 on a fire, should we grab a 360 on our people? How often do we grab a 360 when we get to work on our team? Grab a 360 on a personnel issue we're dealing with. It's imperative for us as leaders to get all the information before we commit ourselves and our team into the hazard zone. And if we do that, we grab a 360, we have a much better chance of creating this environment where our folks are catered to, our folks understand what we're talking about. Because we're going into the hazard zone in leadership. There's a reason not everybody does it, and there's a reason not everybody's successful at it. I believe you are a leader because you chose to be, but you stay a leader because you are actually doing it. Leaders have the responsibility to grab a 360 on every situation and know what we're going into before we commit it, because I'm thinking you're going to go to a lot more people issues than you are fire issues, right? Now, I'm going to tell you, gathering information is pivotal, and we can screw it up. There's a lot of situations where we choose to make that quick reaction and we don't gather all the information. And that can take a lot of credibility out of our pockets as a leader. We have the responsibility to actually get the information before acting.
Hello? My favorite part of that video is, is uh, you know, he's all fired up, and the captain comes in and says, this is what we're doing, the doobie size. And they're like, yeah, Cap, that's right. And then he's like, it's the White House. And he's like, oh, I'll be right over here. <laughs> he takes off. It's, uh, wow, talk about putting our foot in our mouth. Responsibility to get a 360, to gather all the information before we commit ourselves to the hazard zone because our, our troops, our folks, rely on us to do that. And sometimes when we miss the mark, man, it takes a lot of credibility out of our pocket. It makes us look a little goofy. Now, I talked to you a little bit about bringing back the feeling. And that concept is you go to events like this or you're involved in things and you get fired up, but you have trouble figuring out how you're going to bring this back to your team. And I tell you, over the years, some things have worked and some things hasn't worked. But one of the things I found curls back to two types of time. There is chronos time, chronological time. A lot of the hard work of the day goes through chronos time. And there's kairos time or kairos time. Keros time are those little bits. You don't get near as much of it. Keros moments are those things you saw in that opening video, those little things you could attach to that got you fired up. Or in your personal life, Mary Keros moment is a child being born, getting married, one of these major things in your life. But you get little bits of Keros time, and you never forget having had them. In fact, it's those Keros moments that get you through the chronological time, the stuff that's kind of the grind, the long stuff of watching the clock tick. So coming back to these two types of time, if two types of time are chronos time and kairos time, those kairos moments are what motivate us. That's why we show video clips like that one opening video clip about the little things you do. It's the things that made us want to do this job. It's the things you don't do every single time the alarm goes off, but when you do, it keeps you going for a while. There's a reason after we had a fire, people are pretty good for a while. There's a reason we feel good after having a fire, and I don't mean it negatively like we want fires to occur, but when you come back, does morale go up a little bit when people got to actually work and do their job? Those are Keros moments, and we're reminding them of how powerful those Keros moments can be. So if we're aware of that from a leadership standpoint, we find ways to show them Keros moments. In the midst of long days of chronological time, whether it's a promotional video, going out and training, finding a way to give them glimpses of those Keros moments reinvigorates the motivation, which equals job satisfaction, which equals staying around, retention. If anything from that video, that opening video, you could attach to, whether it's being sworn in, Go into a big fire. If any little bit of that you can attach to and it just gets you excited about why you're here, if it works for you, it can work for them. If it can work for your team, you just got to find ways to attach them back to a Keros moment, just one, and it keeps them going for a little while longer. Every year, the firefighters get together and they usually buy a present for the fire chief. And one year, this was my, my present, and it, was, it is still to this day one of my prized possessions. It doesn't say chief on it, and it doesn't say boss. It says coach. This is a Keros moment for me. Them acknowledging that I was, I was their coach. And I was a training chief at the time, and that feeling of getting to train folks up to see them go on and do phenomenal things. Coach, one of the most powerful things. All I have to do is look at this stocking, and it's a Keros moment for me. It gets me going again, it gets me all pumped up because I realize that's exactly what my responsibility is as a leader, is to be a coach and to be seen as a coach. And Carol's moments remind you of good times and they make you happy and they keep you going. Job satisfaction. Think for a moment about a Carol's moment. I'm sure you have a Carol's moment in this room, but I'm sure all of yours are different. And it could have been when you went through the academy and you graduated. It could have been when you got your last fire certification. It could have been when you did the rare thing and you saved a life from a fire or took care of a baby. Any of those moments you have, just think about it for a second. Think about what that does to you when you think about that moment. And if it works for you, it can work for them. It can work for your team. Keros moments. Raise your hand if you've ever been to an NFL football game. Okay. So you can relate to this. That feeling you feel when you walk in the stadium, bright colors, the size of everything, it's an amazing place, an NFL football stadium. And you get to the game and everybody's there and they're all riled up and you get to your seat and you have the necessary beverage and all the things you need to be comfortable for that game. And once you get into your seat, the national anthem plays. Picture it with me. And as the national anthem plays, 
and our women and men of our armed forces post the colors on the field, and everybody in that station is just alive. For just a moment, you're reminded everybody's on the same team. You get goosebumps. And then those goosebumps fill, turn to chills when those planes fly over the top of that stadium. Can you see it? And now the magic starts, right? The announcer starts to announce the home team, right? The deep voice and the music, boom starts to build and you're feeling this and the volume raises and there's fireworks and there's smoke and there's power and they introduce everybody that's Kairos time and that's energy and that's pride all in one do you feel it yeah Woo! okay I told you I'd keep doing this that is the home field advantage right that's why they do that. That's why there's smoke and fireworks and lights when that team comes out onto the field and they announce their name. Why do they do that? Because they're giving their team the home field advantage. They're giving their team the power of Kairos moments and energy all in one. We own the home field advantage in this room. You are the home field advantage. As the leader in your organization, knowing your people well enough, you become the home field advantage. You cheer for them. You celebrate them. You've trained them, and you know what they're capable of. You're those people cheering for them as they go on to the field. You are the Kairos moments. Whether it's in your own stadium or on foreign soil or wherever you go, you own it as a leader. And if you own the home field advantage, you can use it to your advantage. You can use it to your team's advantage and make them feel it. Cheering, supporting them, knowing them is the home field advantage. And party poppers are cheap. It's an easy way to get them going. A flashlight and party popper so far is your, is your shopping list. A few years back, uh, when we still lived in Colorado, we went to a, a Denver Bronco game, which is my home team, the Denver Broncos. We're playing my wife's team, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, folks, we bought these tickets at the last minute to Mile High, and we paid the last minute price for the tickets. But they were so good. Our tickets were so good you could almost touch those lights that illuminate the stadium. That's how good these seats were, right? So as we go to this game and we hike up this incredibly steep stairs into the area where we're going, I'm ready to sit with my, my, my Broncos fans, my orange and blue, but we sit, get to our seats and it's like a sea of black and gold. <laughs> my wife was very pleased. So we're sitting up here amongst all these Pittsburgh Steeler fans at my Bronco game, and the game was phenomenal. Went into the nighttime, got into the fourth quarter, an incredibly close game. And as it got dark, you could see all the city lights around of, of the Denver metro area and, and vehicles on the road and so forth. And the game was so close, but something out of the corner of my eye caught, caught my eye. And it was the flashing lights of a Denver fire ladder truck going to an incident. It was followed by an engine, and then a battalion chief, and then a heavy rescue. And I could not take my eyes off of those fire trucks, despite how close the game was and the price I had paid to be there, I couldn't take my eyes off of those fire trucks. Another gentleman that came with us, another firefighter, I looked over at him and he was watching those fire trucks instead of watching the game. And I tell you what, that, that moment taught me how powerful this profession is. A profession where you'd honestly still want to be on that fire truck going to get to do what you do instead of being at the Denver Bronco game. Even as close as that game was and how much we had paid to be there, we wanted to be on those fire trucks. That's powerful. And that's incredibly powerful for us as leaders because it's a Kairos moment. Even sitting at that game, I knew what it felt like to be on that truck, gearing up, going to a job. Man, that's powerful. And not every profession has something like that. So as leaders, we can, we can capitalize on it. We can use it. In fact, I shared that story with a friend of mine who works for UPS. And he said, Matt, when I am off duty and I see a package, I do not see the need to deliver it. He, it's, it's a unique profession. Not everybody has it. Let's talk a little bit about what it means to fuel your tank. And I told you that Stephen Gower will say you cannot give what you do not have. You've got to take care of yourself in a way where you actually have something to give the team. Fuel your own tank. AKA, have the energy. Be pumped up, ready to give. Because the, the road of leadership is not you know, downhill and paved. It's uphill, and it's rough, and it's rocky. It's a tough job, and that's why we're not all doing it. But if you consider experiences and things in your life to top off that fuel tank, you can keep yourself going. You've got to recognize when your leadership tank starts to run dry. When your fuel tank starts to run dry, you feel stranded. You feel isolated. You feel empty, and you cannot give what you do not have. 
You have to establish internal gauges, something to tell you when your leadership tank is running a little bit low so you can get a quick pick-me-up because your troops depend on it. If you're dropping, you can't give what you do not have. Whether it's every day, every month, every year, something to keep yourself going. Keep coming to conferences like this. Watch a promotional video. Get out and train, but do something to keep that leadership tank topped off. You owe it to your team, but you also owe it to yourself because you deserve the satisfaction in having led. Now, here's an example. Since I am the fire chief, I work for a group of fire commissioners, elected officials, politicians. And as I sit in a meeting and they're talking about an issue, sometimes they ask my opinion and sometimes they don't ask my opinion, but it may be an issue that I'm not real happy about. I can kind of feel it going on, right? And then finally, they will <coughs> refer to me and ask me a question. And before I respond, you'll see me close my eyes for just a second. When I close my eyes, folks, I'm driving a gunmetal gray 911 Carrera. My wife, Kristen, sitting next to me, we both have our Starbucks, and my two boys are in the back seat, and I can hear their laugh. Just for a split second, as I close my eyes, all of that happens in my mind. Then I open my eyes, and I respond to the controversial thing they asked me. And when I do that, I can't help but respond with a little more compassion and a little more love because I had a quick fueling plan. I fueled up my tank real quick with my little happy place so I could respond properly. Because our troops depend on me to do it. It's my job to represent this fire department in front of the elected officials. I can't let them down. I'm their advocate. So I have to have a quick fueling plan to top it off so I can respond appropriately, maintain credibility, respond with a little love and compassion, maybe not put my foot in my mouth. And you have to have a quick fueling plan to do it. So I challenge you, come up with a happy place, have a quick fueling plan, because there are times that you need to lead in the midst of chaos, in the midst of frustration, make sure you can top off that tank real quick. Make sure you have at least a happy place to go to to quickly top it off so you can take care of your team. Several years back, my wife and I decided to go on a tropical vacation. And so um, we took off from what was a very cold Colorado foggy morning. We landed in this tropical sanctuary. And uh, I had a couple plans for this big trip. Plan number one was I was excited that my mobile device would not be alerting me to an incident, right? I needed a break. The beeper wasn't going to go off. And plan number two was to do absolutely nothing. And that plan was never achieved. <laughs> what do you do when you get out there on a beach? Well, you lay down, you lay in the sun, you start thinking about positive things, good things. Kairos moment. And as you're sitting on the beach and you're thinking about Kairos, Kairos moments, you're thinking about things that make you happy, you start thinking about your team a little bit. Ooh, what can I do better for them? What am I doing good for my team? My nothing time became something quite valuable because I thought about the stuff I could do better. I thought about my team. I thought about where we were at and what I could do better as a leader. So another challenge to you is give yourself some nothing time because you may get something tremendously beneficial out of it. And if it works for you, it can work for your team. Don't fill the day too full. Don't pack every second too full. Give them a little nothing time. It's amazing what our minds come up with with a little nothing time. And especially if we put ourselves in a positive environment, whether it be the environment you create in the firehouse or land on a beach somewhere, either way, you're in a positive place and you think about good things. And thinking about good things equals Kairos moments, and Kairos moments motivate you, and motivated folks stick around. We retain motivated folks. The job satisfaction and the place they want to be is with you at the firehouse. The place they feel the best is because of the environment you create for them because you know them so well. This nothing time concept is probably more and more evident today than ever and we live in a very, very, very fast paced world. Things are moving pretty fast and we're trying to always constantly keep up. When you're driving to a stoplight, you can admit it if you do this, or even if I'm the only one, but when you come up to a stoplight, are you moving kind of fast, and do you do the assessment? Who does the assessment? You count how many cars are in each line at the stoplight, don't you? You count how many cars, and you navigate yourself into the proper lane so you can get off the stoplight pretty quick, right? We live in a fast-paced world, but some of you take it even further. You're, you're calculating the size of that vehicle. You're, you're saying, that's a school bus. I'm not going to get behind him. This little red car is going to be quick off the line. And you navigate into the fastest position and you take off. You take it a step further. 
Or you go to the grocery store and you do the same thing. You're counting carts in each line. I'm going to navigate over here to the next cart. But some of you take it a step further and you're counting items in the cart. <laughs> you're fabricating how quick that checker outer goes. This person has kids. I'm not going to get behind them. That'll solve them. We're constantly just moving, moving, moving. What a fast-paced life we live. And it's okay to be fast-paced, and it's okay to have a lot going on, but sometimes we have to slow down and schedule a little nothing time, a little white space, a little time for us to simply focus on whatever comes to mind or focus on our team. We live in such a fast-paced world where every second counts, we have to make every second meaningful, and sometimes it means giving ourselves the time to fuel back up, to make sure we can't, can't not have something to give, if you will. We are going to take a break and grab a cup of coffee. And the reason I say coffee is because when we come back, I'm going to talk a lot about coffee. You'll learn very quickly throughout the rest of my presentation that I have quite enough fondness for coffee. But I've learned some leadership lessons actually from coffee. So I've taught you to take a break. I've taught you to take a little nothing time. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and do that. Take 10, 15 minutes, mingle with each other, grab a cup of coffee, and we'll come back here in a little bit. Thank you. Back in Ritter Rock. And roll, all right. All right, so I told you we'd talk a little bit about coffee. I can't help but talk a little bit about coffee. Um, so I have a few stories, hopefully. My, my goal with that would be when you, uh, now every time you have a cup of coffee, you will consider these stories, and you'll get a couple of little leadership attributes from it. So um, my story number one is at the office every day at about 2.45, not 2.44, but 2.45, I would have afternoon coffee. <laughs> I'm like a, like a machine, right? And so I'd go over to the break room and I'd start brewing a pot of coffee in the office and then I'd run back to my desk and I'd little get a little work done and then I thought it was done brewing, I'd run back and get myself a cup of coffee. Boom, boom, boom. And one day I was brewing, getting ready to brew this pot of coffee and one of our firefighters walked in, she was visiting from a station by, and instead of me running back to my desk to get a little work done, I sat there and we talked and we watched the coffee brew. And in that short time it took to watch the coffee brew, I learned more about her than I had ever known. I learned about what was going on in her life, what motivated her, why she worked for our fire department, what she cared about. In just the time it took to brew a pot of coffee, I learned a tremendous amount about this gal. My takeaway from that was, you know, as fire service administrators or anybody else, we're so busy, oh, I, can't, I can't find enough time to get out to the stations to visit the troops. I can't find enough time to spend time with our people. And it illustrated to me it doesn't take much time to have very meaningful time with your team. So I've changed my slogan from stop and smell the roses to stop and, stop and smell the coffee or watch the coffee brew. And I, I, as simple as that sounds, maybe next time you brew a pot of coffee at the station or at the office, sit and chat with one member of your team for the time it takes to brew a pot of coffee. It's amazing what you can learn from them. The next thing happened um, when we moved from Colorado to Florida. So in Colorado, coffee takes on a different meaning than it does in Florida. In Colorado, especially Colorado Springs, I can be in my favorite coffee establishment and I can literally look out the window and down the road and see the next coffee establishment of the same brand. That's how saturated that market is. But I tell you what, I loved it because I am I'm a Starbucks guy. I have to have it, right? So this concept is, I'm sure it's part of a global marketing plan as Starbucks takes over the world, but nonetheless, I, I got a level of comfort with this. I knew no matter where I was at in my town, if I was driving around, I knew there was a Starbucks around the corner, and I felt comfortable. This level of accessibility gave me a warm and fuzzy feeling. They opened really early, they stayed up really late, I had accessibility to my, my coffee. And that had taught me something about accessibility as leadership, because shortly after that, um, I moved here, or excuse me, moved, moved to Florida. And Florida doesn't have quite the same accessibility to Starbucks. In fact, I had to go find a Starbucks. I had to look, look it up on my phone and track down a Starbucks. And it made me feel uncomfortable. I was used to the accessibility. I was used to that comfort and knowing around every corner is the Starbucks if I needed. And in Florida, it wasn't that way. I had to go track them down. And so I, I, I felt a little less comfortable, a little less warm and fuzzy. And I equate that to our people because I get a lot of comments of, I just can't find you, Chief. Where are you? You're too busy. I don't want to interrupt you. When I wasn't accessible to our people, they didn't feel as warm and fuzzy. They didn't feel like I was there to back them up. 
And so just like I felt when I went to Colorado to Florida and I couldn't find a Starbucks, I lost my comfort of accessibility. As leaders, we have to be accessible. We have to be accessible to our team when they need us to provide that level of comfort. And there's varying levels of development of your team to where you want to wean them off of your leadership, if you will, and send them out into the world. But when you're building people up, when you're trying to recruit and retain folks, being accessible as the leader is important to provide that comfort level so they know you have their back. They know you are the home field advantage and you're accessible to them. The final one was a little bit of knowing your environment. So similar, in Colorado I'd have a meeting across town and I'd swing into a Starbucks, grab a couple cups of coffee and go on to my meeting. And usually when I showed up at the meeting and came in with two cups of coffee, people were pretty pleased. Hey, it was kind of a nice gesture. It stimulated the conversation and then it showed them I cared about being there. Well, I did this a few times after we moved to Florida, and I'd show up with my two cups of coffee, and I'd get kind of an odd look from people. And that happened a couple times in, the row, in a row to where I finally asked, what's the deal? And, and uh, apparently in Florida, they have this thing called iced coffee. And so you don't just ask if you take cream and sugar, you ask if they want it cold or hot. Who knew? Maybe I should have known with 100 degree temperatures and 100% humidity, but nonetheless, I did not change with my environment. And I didn't ask enough questions to learn my environment. And I learned from a leadership standpoint, sometimes the answers are not going to fall in our lap. We have to go out and get them. And we have to change with our environment. If we know our team well enough, we're creating an environment for them, but we have to understand the environment we're in. And our environment is changing constantly in the fire service and emergency services in general and in leadership in general, because leadership is based on people. Well, people change constantly. Different people are coming in, their lives are changing. The environment is ever changing that we're trying to lead in. And if we're not astute to that environment and we don't go get some of the information, we're not gonna change with our environment. Now I ask cold or hot coffee and people give me that smiling face when I walk in again and I have now adapted to my environment, but it took me going out and getting the information. There's a lot of barriers sometime and we assume the information will come to us and that's just simply not always the truth. We have to go out and stimulate some of that information. Go out and ask the questions, watch a pot of coffee brew, and get the information we need to take care of our team. My last, see if you get this, my last little comment about coffee is, even people that don't like coffee when it's brewing, they think, oh, that smells really good. Even crappy coffee smells really good when it's brewing until you take a sip. How can you equate that to leadership? It may smell good, it may look good, but if you're not actually doing it, our folks are gonna take a sip. So think about these techniques. Leadership isn't just shiny on the surface. Leadership is a root core caring about your people and taking care of them. All right, enough about coffee. I won't go on and on about coffee for too long. So, excuse me. So our, our folks in the fire service, we're trying to create this environment for them where they feel comfortable, where they, they feel like they're part of the team. And one of those things is making sure they're in the know. And I mean that from the standpoint of them kind of knowing the global plan. People feel valued when you share the plan with them. People feel valued when you tell them the information. And we are not in the era anymore of knowledge being power. And as the leader, I'll just keep all the knowledge so nobody else can know it. And that keeps me being the leader. That's not leadership. Leadership is trying to build those folks up to be better than you could have ever been. So not knowledge is power, knowledge is power outward. And sometimes when we retain the, the, the knowledge, we retain the information, we put them in tremendously uncomfortable situations. This has happened to me two places I've traveled. One was the Mexico City Airport. And when you go to the Mexico City Airport, if you've been there, you know it's not quite as resorty as some of the other Mexico airports. It's not Cancun, it's not Cabo. Mexico City Airport's a little different. When you check in and they give you your plane ticket, it does not say the gate on it. It says the time your plane leaves, but instead of telling you the gate, they send you to this big holding area with lots of seats, which are all full, so you stand. And you sit there waiting for your plane. And a really rough PA system comes on. It's kind of tough to hear. And once in Spanish, once in English, and then once in Spanish again, they tell you what flight it is and what gate it's taking off from, from this holding area. And so I'm looking at my ticket. And my comparison says that plane is about ready to be in the air, and I have yet to know which gate we're going to. And then over this rough PA system, they say, my wife said, 
they said, which where we're going, I know eight words in Spanish and they all have to do with drink orders, so I didn't do very good with this in the airport. But she convinces me that they're saying that's our flight and it was leaving now. And so then the mad dash begins, led by me, the frantic foreigner. I'm forgetting small children. I'm crying. and We're running for that gate, right? And we get there and we barely make the plane. And it begs the question, why did they do that? How did that feel? Talk about uncomfortable. I didn't go to the bathroom for two hours and, you know, waiting for my, my name to be called. That withholding information made us feel uncomfortable. It made us feel frantic. Do we ever make our folks run for the gate when we don't have to? Do we ever keep information from our folks that they would just feel a little bit more comfort in knowing so they didn't have to feel that feeling of running for the gate? Because when you run for the gate, you feel like you're not important. You feel like you're not valuable. You feel like something's been kept from you. Now, of course, in public safety, we have to be very flexible. Our schedule changes on a dime, and I think our folks understand that. But if there's a way to include your team in the master plan, the global vision, then you keep them from having to run for that gate and you keep them from having to feel uncomfortable. And when we feel comfortable, we get more motivated. We feel happier in our environment, and people stick around. Now, I don't want to, I, you know, I talked to, I talked to you about the warm and fuzzy thing. My goal is not to sit up here and sugarcoat all this stuff and say, this is great and you're good to go. It's not easy. None of the stuff I'm talking about today is easy. Leadership is like a lead weight sometimes. It is tough. And in fact, maybe you need me to stand up here and tell you that if it's hard, you're probably doing it right. The leadership road is difficult, and none of this stuff I'm talking about today is some natural-born talent you have. It takes work to know your people. You're not, you're not born with it. I subscribe to the Aristotle quote of, we are that which we repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence is not art, it's simply habit. Leadership it's not an art form or something you're born with. There's a habit component of it. And if we're talking about knowing our people this well to create this environment where they want to pack 15 years into 10, it's habit. And it takes a lot of work on the side of the leader. We are that which we repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence is not art. It's habit. Just constant habit. I opened with that concept of 10 years of experience, repeating year one over again 10 times, and packing 15 into 10. Some of the components of that come back to credibility. And so when we talk a little bit about credibility, either it's earned or you start with it. Who cares? Either way, you have credibility. You can, learn, you can use it or, or lose it. I'm going to use the John Maxwell kind of analogy here. Is he, he talks about credibility being like change in your pocket. So you start with a little change in your pocket in the leadership world. And as you're doing good things, you're getting a little more change in your pocket here or there. You screw up a little bit, you lose a little change in your pocket. You screw up big, you lose a lot of change. And if you screw up too big too soon, you go broke. And if you're not constantly putting a little change in your pocket, you'll never make it. Because you will screw up. We will screw up as leaders. And so you think of this change in our pocket of taking care of our people, building a little change here and there, screwing up, losing a little change here and there. That change may not make you rich. But that change in your pocket will absolutely change lives. The change in your pocket in leadership, your credibility and the work you do for your team is actually that value of what's going to change lives. So think about what you're doing every day to put a little change in your pocket. What are you doing to take care of your team or you work for them to put a little change in your pocket? And again, knowing we will screw up, knowing we're going to lose some change, maybe teach a little mercy, a little grace in your leadership as a, as a blanket to fall on when we make mistakes. Some of the greatest leaders I've ever known are the ones that say, I screwed up on that and here's what I'm going to do about it, right? That level of leadership, that, that's true leadership by example. So think about that change in your pocket and what you could be doing to put a little bit more change in your pocket. What you could be doing for your team to earn that credibility so they know you're there for them. So we'll move on with a couple of things. One, you get a, few, a little bit of change in your pocket, use it wisely. Two, this leadership component is not easy. In fact, I'm going to say something about that change. You know, you may start in your organization as the, the guy from the other fire department. The grass is greener on the other side thing, and you're important to everybody. Or maybe you have street credit, right? Maybe you were the guy out there doing it. Or maybe you're the super-duper resume builder, and you have all the cool stuff on the piece of paper about you. All of that stuff doesn't matter at the end, because you can lose that credibility just as quick as you can gain it, right? The truth is action. The truth is actually using that stuff 
to better your team. So we'll move forward with knowing you get some change in your pocket. Use it wisely. Strive to get a degree in your team and know them that well. Grab a 360 on every situation you're facing before you commit yourself to the hazard zone. Think about two parts of time. The Keros moments, the things that invigorate people. And if all else fails, make sure you've got a happy place. Make sure you've got a place to go to to top off your leadership fuel tank so you can do it. Because folks, it, it's okay to not love every second it takes to achieve the moments you do love. It's okay to not love every part of leading but it sure feels good having led. It's okay not to love every part of parenting when you're in the checkout line and the baby threw up all over and you don't even know where number two is. Man, that's rough, but it sure feels good having parented. It's okay not to love every second you go through to achieve the moment you do love. And having led is one of the best feelings for fueling our tank. And obviously knowing the takeaways for our team of having led them and how they feel when you provided that to them. It's okay not to love every second to get there. The next thing I want to talk to you about is, is, is the concept of superiority. Over time, some leadership models have talked about, well, I'm a leader because I wear bugles, or I'm a leader because I'm a promoted, and I, I just I can't, tell you, I, I can't tell you that's the way, it, the way it works. You may have a position, but leadership comes at every level. Every person in this room is clearly a leader. You're here learning about how you can make your organization the place people want to be the best possible. And if, if some of you might have known it, I've done a little research on a few of you, and you, you're freakishly odd individuals. I learned that a little bit about it. You say, me? Freakishly odd individuals. I keep a prop. You might find this hard to believe. Matt's got a prop. I keep a prop in my office. And this prop is incredibly important to me because I need to remind myself every once in a while that I'm just a ridiculously, freakishly odd individual. Things will finally come to me in the organization in my office. Somebody did something ridiculous and so forth, and I sit there, oh, I can't believe you did that. I need to remember that I've probably done that myself. So I'm going to tell you this story. So this hat, back in high school, you know, to, to pass time on the weekends, what I would do is I'd go to McDonald's, and I would bag, get a take-home take bag and a take-out cup, and I would duct tape them to the roof of my car, and I would drive around. That's right, that's right, typical high school kid thing, right? We'd cruise around town with that McDonald's bag and the cup on the top, and I was amazed at the, there was no limit to the things people would go to to try and stop us, and they, got, they wanted our fries to be salvaged, right? So one weekend, oddly, I, I was wearing a sombrero. I'd lie to you if I told you I don't know where. I'm, wearing a, I'm a high school kid. I'm wearing a sombrero. I'm in the back seat of my car. We got that bag on top and the cup, and we're cruising around town, and when people would come up beside, i just... Just kind of look at him in the corner of my eye. Who's this weirdo wearing a sombrero? Well, a cop saw us. And the cop crossed three lanes of traffic to get behind us to, get, to let us know that our Big Mac was on top of the car. We pulled over. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what have we done? And then it clicked. If I don't beat him to that bag, he's going to know my little secret. That's likely not going to go over very well. I fling out of the car to grab my bag. I get it just in time, and I'm standing here in the middle of a parking lot wearing a sombrero with this cop walking up. And he said, oh, you know, I'm glad you got your, your big back or whatnot. All I could think to say to him was, gracias? <laughs> Folks, we've all done some ridiculous things in our lives. And we never lead out of superiority like we're better than anybody else. And if you need a sombrero or a disco ball in your office and put it up on the wall so when somebody walks in and says, I can't believe I did this, and say, guess what I did? <laughs> Don't, like, let me tell you about my past. Just keep yourself grounded. Just keep yourself grounded. Find some symbol to keep yourself grounded to say, I'm not better than anybody because I'm a leader. I work for them. I've screwed up too. I've worn a sombrero and driven around with McDonald's on top of the car for kicks. We're all freakishly odd individuals. And every once in a while, we need a little reminder to take us right back to home, to not lead out of superiority. We are leaders because we chose to be. And we stay leaders because we are actually doing it for our team. And leadership is not superiority. Leadership is them being, being on our team, us working for them. We're always training future leaders, and I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, we talked about molding quite a bit, and we talked about what we build in a person. We're always training future leaders. 
And again, they're always going to look at us just like a mirror, and they're going to emulate what we do and how we act and our attitude and how we handle those bugles on our collar. So keep that, that molding in mind. I'm going to transition to a, another way of kind of saying some of this stuff. If you have kids, you've probably seen the movie Inside Out. Has anybody seen the movie Inside Out? Just, just one? That's pretty good. This movie is probably one of the deepest movies Disney's come up with. Um, blows me away what they came, came up with when, in this movie. But this movie talks a little bit about who we are, um, what makes us up. It talks a little bit about some of the memories we go through and some of the things that create who, who we are. And so we're going to watch a video clip here in a moment. And the goal of this for me is to describe to you, to really put in black and white, how you know your people well enough how you can cater this environment to your team. So as soon as I get it working, I'm going to play this video. I say as soon as I get it working, because there's always going to be a technical challenge when you're getting it working. But um, sometimes, just give me just a moment, I have to remove it and put it back in. So I'll describe a couple components of it here for a second, just so you kind of understand what we're talking about. So in this video, the concept, now it, I say it's one of the deepest videos Disney's ever done because the concept is they brought in psychologists and their goal was to create a video that actually was, it was accurate on kind of how, a, a, in this movie, a kiddo, but how a person's mind works and how certain things happen in our lives and they create the lens, if you will, for how we view what happens next. And so within this lens, where we have a good thing happen and we look at it a certain way, we have a bad thing happen, we look at it a certain way, but within this lens, that's how we view that, that situation moving forward. I can equate it back to the concept of, of uh, you know, not making training a dirty word because if training becomes a dirty word, we're going to look, look through a certain lens to achieve it, right? So this video does a, a pretty good job of describing that to you. So the movie certainly describes it better than I ever could, but uh, this concept of uh, core memories and, and what matters to us and so forth, you know, I, I like her opening comment was, do you ever look at someone and wondering what's going on up there? Do you ever look at someone and wonder what's going on up there? I, I, I find that I do that quite a bit. I look at someone and wonder what's going on up there. Well, two concepts to take from this. Concept one is these memories. And they're these colored globes, right? And when, when the kid has a good memory, a joyous memory, it's yellow, and a, a sad memory is blue, anger is red, disgust is green, and that's the lens in which that memory occurred. And I gave you the example of if training becomes a dirty word, then training probably isn't yellow. It's probably blue, or it's probably green, it's probably red. And so our team comes to us with all these different colors, all these different memories. They also come to us with these concept of islands, which I'll talk about in a minute. Throughout this movie, Joy, the, the yellow one, the, the gal in charge, she measures everything on success. How many perfect days, like she said, could we have? And that's what makes a day successful, is how many perfect days, another perfect day. Thinks that good in life only comes through the experience of these positive things. And you see her talk a little bit about enter sadness. Well, right now in the fire service in general, we're getting a little more awareness of mental health components in the fire service. We're taking it more and more seriously than we ever did. And I, I hop on this platform for just a minute to consider how we as company officers, how we as leaders respond to folks that are looking through things in all these different lenses. And throughout this entire movie, towards the end, you realize the star of the show isn't joy. The star of the show is sadness because you can't experience real joy without sadness, without the ability to kind of let it out and, see how, and know how you're feeling. I see this happen a lot in our fire service of we as individuals believe we're supposed to be happy all the time. We're on Facebook, we're on these different things, we're watching, we're supposed to be happy all the time and happy days are the best and so forth. And our goal is to be happy and joyous all the time. But we do not live in a perfect world and we're gonna have bad days. And when we have bad days, some of our, our ways of tackling that is simply trying to convince the person, no, be happy, you're supposed to be happy. <clears throat> Sometimes telling the person having a rough day, you're supposed to be happy, isn't the remedy. Sometimes acknowledging the fact that they're having a blue day, they're having a sad day, is okay. 
and it comes back to the components we've talked about of leadership is listening and knowing our people well enough to when they're having that day, they don't need us to come in as the leader and say, you're supposed to be happy. They need us to come in and listen to what, what's making it a bad day. And just validating, acknowledging the fact that they're having a rough day and they're human and it's okay is sometimes what that person needs to get through that tough time. And so there's a lot of challenges as a leaders of how we deal with somebody having a bad day, how we deal with mental stress challenges in the fire service. And this is only one simple technique, but the concept is every day has all those different colored globes in it. And when our folks approach us as leaders and they're having a bad day, we don't have to tell them, no, you're supposed to have good days. We can acknowledge you had a bad day. We can validate it. We can listen. And sometimes that leadership we give them is just the validation they need to work on through it because sadness can actually equal what joy really is. We, we understand joy better when we have levels of sadness. Now, I don't mean to get too deep. This is not a psychological <laughs> presentation by any means, but this concept of islands I want to talk about next, um, I think that hopefully will allow you to attach this concept of knowing our people really well. So this little gal had different islands, Hockey Island, Family Island, Friendship Island, Truth Island, those sort of things. Everybody in this room has a variety of islands. Some of you may be more than others since you've been around longer or something's gone away and so forth. As you're trying to retain members of your organization or recruit members of your organization, especially those at varying generational levels and age, acknowledging this island concept is a way for you in your mind to kind of make the attachment to that's what makes this person this person. That's what makes you, you. Back to our, our original principle of the day is the only way you can lead people is to truly, genuinely know about them. Think about the islands for a minute. Think about your islands and think about the islands of your team. If you understand those islands, if you understand at least that they exist and that this person is made up of very different things, it's a lot easier for you as a leader to create an environment that supports them. But you can't create that environment unless you know the person well enough. You can't create the environment unless you really acknowledge those islands and cater to them and cater to who the person is. So moving on with that a little bit, and this concept of who people are and the lenses we look through, the next tools I'm going to give you are these concepts of foundational leadership values, which I, I showed, shared with you I would give you. We teach a company officer when they arrive to the scene to create a solid foundation for the incident. From step one, from size up to the end of the incident, we want them to create a real solid foundation for us until the chief officer arrives and takes command or whatnot. And so when we're talking about building a solid foundation, one of the mottos I like to give is give and you shall receive. If we want our folks to build a solid foundation for us to take over when we arrive, we have to give them certain attributes of that. So I'm going to take you through a foundation. When we're building a foundation, we start with a substance, right? Something, something that is moldable like that Play-Doh, something that's pliable that's going to gain strength over time. That Play-Doh, that substance, is our mission. The purpose of our organization, our mission statement, what we are is our mission, is the substance. That's the root of what we're all about as an organization and the substance of that foundation. Second, we need a mold. We need something to put that substance in to make it shape right. The mold gives it shape. It gives us a picture of the future, a vision of the future. A mold is the vision of our organization. Where we want to be, what we want to become, your vision statement or your vision of your organization is that mold. Next, we need something to reinforce it, something to give it strength when we're talking about foundation, something to support it every day, every minute, every second. We reinforce that through our values. Every day, every minute, every second, you make decisions based off a set of values. That's what reinforces the mission and the vision of the organization. Finally, we need time. No good foundation sets up without some time to gain strength. And how do we get through the time? How do we get through these different things? It's through expectations. Clear, high, and obtainable expectations. And when we use these foundational principles, mission, vision, values, and expectations, we create a really strong foundation for our folks, a foundation we want to take over in times of chaos, a foundation that, that lets them perform even when we're not there. I want to give you an example. In 1982, a major corporation dealt with a problem of catastrophic proportion. If you remember back to 82, those of you in the room, cyanide was placed in a bottle of Tylenol and it killed a customer. When this issue hit the media, 
they had to make a quick decision with the, set the tone for the rest of their future. The only way they could make this incredible decision fast and accurately and to that proportion was on their established values. Without hesitation, they recalled $75 million worth of Tylenol. They paid a tremendous short-term cost, but actually emerged even stronger. This is the glue that holds our organization together, said Michael J. Carey, Vice President of Johnson & Johnson. He said, our message is to produce business results, but not at any cost within our value system. Folks, you make $75 million decisions every day. The team you work with makes $75 million decisions every day. And if we provide them with these foundational principles, mission, vision, value, and expectations, they can make those decisions even if we're not there, based on their values, quickly, $75 million decisions. You know, we have a lot of policies in our organizations, and I'm sure you do the same, but we have one policy, and all our policies are like 302, 1401, whatnot. We have one policy, and it's SOP1, and it's our mission, vision, and values. We don't have to write a policy for everything we do, no can we, but if our folks make solid decisions off of SOP1, they're going to make solid decisions to take care of each other and take care of our community. And that's how we get through these $75 million decisions and we can trust our team to be able to make them. One of the issues we face with mission, vision, and values, and I know some of you can cringe when I say that because every time you get a new fire chief, do you go through new mission and vision and values? They're more than something framed and stamped on the wall, right? They should be something that we live through every day. Every time we make a decision in the firehouse on a scene, we sign a check at headquarters, mission, vision, and values. Those, those decisions should be all rooted around that same thing. One of the problems we face in the fire service where we detach from that is our folks, these folks you're trying to recruit, the folks you are trying to retain, they come to you with a set of values. They come to you with a personal vision of who they want to be. And so that vision is here. And your organization has a set of values and a vision they want to be, and that is here. And if those are going two different directions, people don't stick around. If my personal vision is doing this and the organization vision is doing this and I can't identi with it, identify with it, that doesn't feel comfortable. That leads to coming to work every day is uncomfortable. It's not, I don't feel like I'm working towards something. So how do you bridge that gap? And we call it sharing vision. We say to mold those things back together, we have to share vision. And one of the first steps to that is just simply giving our folks a little bit of the why. The why behind the vision. Here's an example. Lieutenant says, Firefighter Joe, I need a ladder on the Charlie side of the structure. He says, yes, Lieutenant. He gets the 24-foot extension ladder off the truck. He goes around the side of the house and he encounters a gate. The gate is locked. So he goes back to his lieutenant and said, I was not able to throw the ladder on the Charlie side of the structure because the gate was locked. Or the lieutenant took two or three seconds longer to say, I need a ladder thrown on the Charlie side of the structure because there's a truck company up top and they've been cut off from their egress. Three more seconds, but he gave them the why. Is a gate and a fence going to stop them? Are hurdles going to get in the way of that firefighter getting a, a, a ladder to the Charlie side of the structure? Absolutely not, because we included him in the why. Couple extra seconds and we told him the why behind what he's doing and it allowed him to have what he needed to complete the process. So the place we start with sharing this vision and having two different roads and joining them is just simply the why behind why this vision, mission, and values is so important to our organization why it matters, and how it's a lot more than just the words stamped on the wall, but it's the meaning behind those words. And sometimes that's just a simple semantics of a word. Our value may be professionalism, and somebody say, well, I can't, I don't know if I can identify with that. I bet if they dissect professionalism in their mind, they will find commonalities. So that's our responsibility and leadership is, how do we bridge that gap? It's simply giving our folks the why and taking them through what our vision is and what their vision is and aligning the two. There's commonalities within them, don't get in the semantics of the word, but sharing vision equals the long-term success of when you come to work, when you volunteer, you're working towards the same thing as the organization. That's satisfying, that's gratifying, that's motivating, and that keeps people around. It also gives them the tools to make the $75 million decisions. There are, uh, I'll give you four, say, building blocks to how we achieve this. One is purpose. We all have a personal purpose and our organization has a purpose. 
Two is the values. Our organization has a set of values and what they mean. Three is a picture of the future or our vision. And four is action. I think we've identified nothing I've talked about today thus far works without some level of action. And as leaders, when we're giving our folks all this stuff, it's just good intentions until we get to a true level of action. thereof and all of the stuff we've talked about today is very much just a good intention and I'm sure we can we can laugh at the the escalator concept but if we look back to situations in our organizations we've seen it's just right in front of you <laughs> you just got to look outside of your box a little bit and take action to actually make these things happen and not make them just a good intention vision for those that we lead equals ownership vision for us the leader allows us to lead through change. Change is one of our biggest obstacles and biggest benefits in the fire service. We are constantly changing, but how do we lead people through change? So I'm going to ask you to stand up for a minute and pick one partner. I just need you in groups of two. I'll give you just a second. Stand up, find your partner, and go ahead and stand maybe three feet away from your partner. All right, now I want you to stand facing your partner, straight at your partner, three, four feet apart. Stare at this person. Oh, study them up and down. You are here to memorize your partner. All those specific, unique things about this person, visually, of course, because you're not talking. As you study your partner, memorize it. Take it all in, and I'm going to ask you to turn around, do a 180, and look away from your partner. Okay, now that you're looking away from your partner, I want you to change three things about your appearance. Change three things without your partner watching you that they would notice. Whether it's something about your clothing, something you have on, what can you change, even as subtle as it is, what are three things you can change about your appearance? amazing how hard this is for some people to figure out. Three things. All right. As subtle as they are, some of you are really taking this seriously. <laughs> okay, flip back around. Face each other. And now take turns, and I want you to point out to the other person the three things you change. See if you can figure those out. Go ahead. Sometimes it's harder than it looks. Once you got them, go ahead and sit down when you're done. All right, when you sit down, I want you to raise your hand if you got one or more of those things. One or more of those things, raise your hand. Okay, keep your hand up if you got two or more of those things. Keep your hand up if you've got three or more of those things. Four or more, you're cheating, so you, obviously there's three things. Okay, take your seats, take your seats. So, change. I asked you to emit some level of change, and I saw a lot of untucked shirts and glasses coming off and odd things taking place. Belts were coming off, pants stayed on. Thank the good Lord, I won't get asked back if you get crazy. Um, 
That was change, right? And so I've given you a couple seconds. How many of you went ahead and put the stuff back? Did you tuck your shirt back in? No, you put your glasses back. Why did you do that? Did I tell you to do that? No. So it's habit, comfort, right? You, of course, tucked your shirt in today because you wanted your, you're wearing your glasses for a reason because you can't see without them. But change is that very same thing. So why do the folks we're leading through change go back to where they came from? Comfort. There's a level of comfort in the way we do it now. There's a level of comfort in the way you started the day. And it's uncomfortable to sit there with your shirt untucked or your glasses off. And so if we know that, and we know that our folks dealing with this change through leadership we're trying to take them through is challenging, if we know that, what do we do to prevent them from going back to the comfort zone? What do we do to help them go through these levels of change? Well, if I would have told you, guys, um, the expectation is you're going to leave your stuff like that, and we're going to take a group picture outside in, in five minutes or so, would you have left the stuff that way? Or if I told you a picture of the future, I said, this is going to be funny when we're all sitting around at lunch and you guys are all jacked up because you untucked your shirt. Isn't that going to be funny? I gave you a picture of the end result. So if I gave you clear expectations or I gave you a vision, would it help you get through that change? And so as we lead our folks through change, which is uncomfortable, the only way for them to be successful is to know what the expectations are and have a picture of the future. A picture of that end result makes it a lot easier to go through the uncomfortableness of change to get to that prize at the end. And if it works for you, it can work for them. So how can you show your folks what the end result looks like and clarify expectations to help them go through change? We will continue to lead through change as long as we are all in this great fire service. We've got to get good at it. And we've got to make it so people don't go right back to the comfort zone and they can resist that and get over those hurdles to go through change. We've talked a lot about you and them. We'll talk about them for a minute here and them being your team. Now, if you've ever flown, you've been through this, this scenario. Okay, I'll take you through it, right? Your, your plane lands, and as your plane starts taxiing to the gate, you have the elementary but obviously needed this is the captain. Please keep your seatbelt on until the captain has turned off the seatbelt light. Everybody has heard that, and it, hopefully a bit of a duh, right? So you hear that, and your plane continues to go on to the gate. And finally, as your plane gets to the gate, and that seatbelt light turns off, it is like a rapid activation of the seatbelt release system. It's like firecrackers, right? People's seatbelts are coming off, they're grabbing into the overhead bin, and they're doing their thing. All this hustle and bustle, which of course doesn't matter because exit is not imminent. We haven't even got the gate to the plane yet. They haven't done the mysterious cross check and we all wait for first class to get off if you're like me. So there's, a, there's some downtime, right? Well, during that craziness, somebody that was sitting two rows behind you has jockeyed in front of you. Who has seen this happen on an airplane? Now to us, there's a systematic approach to this. So, you know, it should be kind of like church pews. This row goes, then this row, then the next row, but not to this person. We'll call this person the dramatic airplane exiter person. They have jockeyed in front of you two rows during the, the, the fluff. And now that internal struggle, right? You know what I'm talking about, that struggle. Do I say something to them? There's something not right about that. Do I yank them by the belt and purr this person right back? You go through this internal struggle of how dare them go up two rows in front of me. We always get off at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. But you land on no, you chill out a little bit, and you say, you know what? This person probably has a quick connection. Right? They probably have a plane they need to catch. They need to get off sooner than me. I'm at peace with it. And you let it go. And you let it go until you come out and your turns come off the plane and you get out into the terminal and you open up there and there is the dramatic airplane exeter person. And they're not running for a plane. They're not having a quick connection. You know where they are? They're first in line at the Krispy Kreme donut stand. You caught them red -handed. You caught them donut handed, the dramatic airplane exeter person. And how does that feel? this internal struggle you went through, and you gave them the benefit of the doubt, right? But you caught them. You caught them doing what you, what you didn't want them to do. When our folks catch us doing something, it takes all the change out of our pocket. When we become the dramatic airplane exeter of leadership, and we're not putting our people out front, and we're not putting our people out front when it comes to accolades and excitement and taking care of them, we become the dramatic airplane exeter. Because we screw up, or we make decisions that our team doesn't always understand. 
And just like you on that plane, your team goes through this struggle, right? They go through this internal struggle of, Lieutenant, I can't believe you did that. I don't know why. But you know what? A lot of times they give you the benefit of the doubt. You know, he's got, he or she has my best interest in mind. I'm going to let it go. And your crew goes through that internal struggle and they're at peace with it and they trust you. But when they catch you first in line at the Krispy Kreme donut stand, they can't trust you anymore. When they catch you putting yourself out front for accolades instead of them out front for accolades, it changed, takes all the change out of your pocket very quickly. Very difficult thing for us to overcome. So think about that just like uh, you think about any of your leaders. Of You'll go through an internal struggle every once in a while when you don't understand what they're doing. And you hope that your team will give this leader the benefit of the doubt, just like you have your leader. Understand that that's going on in your team. Just don't let them catch you letting them down, because they're trusting you. And you'll become what we call the dramatic airplane exeter of leadership. If you haven't noticed, you know, a lot of these things are what we would call servant leadership techniques. Taking care of our team or serving them. Servant leadership is a heck of a lot like parenting. You love your kids and you take care of their, your kids and you do everything possible to make your kiddos successful even if they don't understand it. I'm still waiting for the day that my six-year-old comes back from being in timeout and says, Dad, I needed that. I don't see it happening. But we know it's for their best interest. So being leaders that take care of our team doesn't mean giving them everything they want. It doesn't mean just doing whatever they want. It means taking care of them just like a parent would. And sometimes that means training them. Sometimes that means giving them accolades. But sometimes that even means discipline, right? It means keeping folks scribed to the roadmap. So servant leadership is a lot about like parenting, taking care of folks just like you would your kids, serving them each and every day, because there's days my kids don't, you know, my kids still love me, but they don't like me very much, right? And there's going to be days as a leader where your troops, they still love you, but they don't like you very much because of the decisions you had to make, and that's okay. It's okay not to love every second of leadership but it sure feels good having led and having made the right decision. It really is what distinguishes a dramatic airplane exeter from a good leader. I talked about the parent analogy. I want to, I want to give you another example here. So a couple psychologists did a study, and they put a person in a room all by themselves. And in the room next door, they made noises that sounded like somebody in the room next door was having a medical emergency. And about 85% of the time, that one person in the other room went and got help. They knocked on the door and said, are you okay? They checked on them. We gave that person five friends, and we made the same noises next door of a medical emergency take place, and only 31% of the time, anybody did anything about it. Did the same thing with uh, fire and smoke. We put one person in a room, and we emitted the smell of smoke under the door. And 75% of the time, that person immediately reacted and went to go see what was wrong, went to go get help. But we gave them five friends, and only 38% of the time, anybody acknowledged the smoke coming, smell coming under the door. Why is our responsibility to act diffused when we're in a group? And the answer is it's not. The answer is it's actually our time to shine as a leader and stand up and be the person that's going to make the right decision. And it's not always easy. But just because we're amongst a group of friends or amongst a group of people we live with and buddy to boss, we still have that responsibility to be the leader. Believe me, your folks will respect you more for doing it in the long run. But we have to realize it's a part of our job to lead even against what the peer pressure may be because we're all leaders because we chose to be. We stay leaders because we're actually doing it. I'm going to slowly start winding down. I stand between you and lunch. I'm always well aware of that, especially if it arrives and you start smelling it. So I'm going to slowly you know, come to a close here. And I appreciate you spending so much time with me this morning. We started with the concept of 10 years of experience and the folks that are repeating year one over again 10 times. And we talked about the desire to get our folks to pack 15 years into 10 and how that comes from an environment we create of knowing our folks that well that they want to cram 15 into 10. It's important for us to remember we only have so much time. Um, a lot of times there's a, a website called Simple Truths, and they talk about the dash. So on, when, you're, when you're done here, when your time on this world is over, they're going to talk about the date you were born, and they're going to talk about the date you passed. But what matters most is that little dash in the middle. 
Think about what you have done with that dash so far. Think about what you can cram into that dash because that dash is what defines your leadership. That dash is what defines who you are and what you've done to give to your team when you work for them. Years back on uh, January 14th of 2004, I was involved in a flashover and the entire room became involved in fire and my SBA mask started to melt and my pant leg got caught on something and pulled up and my leg started to burn and I got disoriented. And you know what I was thinking about? I wasn't thinking about what I didn't get done. I was thinking about, did I fit enough into that dash? If this is it, did I fill it? We had a fire chief recently have a heart attack and when he was laying in that hospital bed, he wasn't thinking about the stack of work not done on his desk. He was thinking about, did he fill that dash? Did he lead people? Did he give them everything he had to serve them and take care of them and build them to be the next leaders after him? And if, if he didn't, could he have a little bit more time to do that? I realized throughout my time that, that I, it, my, what my job is, and I've kind of redefined it quite a bit. I know now that my job is to be the coach of a fire team. And we may give that a lot of different titles, from fire chief to firefighter to lieutenant, you name it. But the coach of a fire team. Maybe that's what we need to get our heads in the right spot of how we take care of these folks coming into our fire service, how we retain them, how we make it last. I'm going to ask my friends in the back to start handing out a couple of things for you. You'll need them in a few minutes. Once you get them, crack them open a little bit and get them glowing. As they hand those out, I'm going to talk just a little bit more about what this means. So, folks, as we close, let's remember, let's remember the disco ball flashlight for just a second and remember what that might have illustrated. The point of that was to say the stars of the show, the stars of our fire service, the folks that actually come to classes like this. You folks caring enough to come to an environment like this to where you can get some tools to bring back and actually use. So that means you guys are already in a tremendously important leadership role, those of you sitting in this room, that you are the leaders of the nation's fire service and you are the leaders that are gonna take us to the future. And some of it you'll be around to see, and some of it you won't. It'll happen after you retire or happen after your dash is completed. But everything you do from now on is really going to set that tone. You're going to create the culture of what our fire service is. You're going to create what our people model themselves after. You're going to be the vision of it. And so I, I challenge you to kind of take care of some of these things on this card, and hopefully you jotted a few things down. If you just take back a few things that you can use tomorrow in your organization, a few things about knowing your people so well you can create an environment that motivates them, about knowing your people so well that you can notice when they're having a blue day. You can ask them the questions to validate it and help them through it. Knowing your team so well that they want to pack 15 into 10, that's the key. If you can do that, you're going to create a fire service that retention it's paramount. Retention is easy when we have all the cards in our, in our deck, when, when you've been the coach of a fire team and you want to have those Karos moments when you're sitting at the Denver Bronco game. And if, like I said, if, you, if you're struggling, don't forget a happy place. Party poppers are cheap. Anybody can buy a flashlight and introduce their crew as they enter the building. So I'm going to ask my team in the back to, we'll dim the lights as far as we can. You may find this hard to believe, but I brought another prop. And uh, the lights only go so dark in here, so try and crack those, those uh, open a little bit. Here's what I'm going to ask. Ask you to look up front here for just a second. Look at these holiday lights. Okay. Look real closely at how brilliant some of these lights are. There are some in this strand that aren't lit. And there are some in this strand that are dimmer than others. Do you have someone in your organization that is dimmer than others? Yeah. But folks, look at the ones that are lit. Look at them closely. Look how bright and brilliant these are. This is what we can do. It is our leadership that will make these dim ones brighter, that will turn on the ones that aren't lit light yet. It is our leadership that will create this phenomenally bright, beautiful light. We have the ability to do it. We own the home field advantage. And so you have every capability to make our fire service what it can be, what you want it to be, by acknowledging that some people need a little help lighting up the lights. But look how beautiful the lights are that are lit. So stand up with me for a second. 
I know it's not dark enough in here to see too many of those glow sticks, but I want you to stand up. I want you to wave them around a little bit. Take that, take that little stick home with you when you get it in the real dark and it works, but use that little stick as a testament. Use that little glow stick as a testament to your ability to lighten up this fire service, to make it bright. You own the future of it. And that whole little stick is going to remind you that, that when you drink a cup of coffee. So thank you all for being here today. God bless you. Travel home safely later today. And again, thank you for listening to the message. I appreciate it. Thank you. you know, being fire chief and police chief and city manager and all that stuff, but I know guys are complaining and the chief did not come around and sit around and talk to us anymore. And don't make that same mistake, you know, because the guys really want to know that you're, you're there for them and you're part of it. So anyway, we're going to eat food in the same place with the breakfast stuff. There's even some of the breakfast stuff left over if you want it. Uh, there's still water and coffee and we're, bring, and we're bringing other drinks, but I'm not sure if they're in there yet. So. Just go in there and get what you want. Uh, we're going to take like 30 minutes probably. Let's shoot for that and just eat in here. And we appreciate you. Again, Chief, thank you thank very you. much. Okay. That's all. Now, women and children first. Go get your food. <laughs>